You're listening to the Changing Normal Podcast, where we strive to outdo the old normal and reject the new normal. And now your hosts, Owen, Dan, and Ben. So this is episode 25. We're going to have another grab bag of everything we want to talk about, I think. <laughs> so that means we'll line it up and see where things go from there. Was that you started the show? Oh, potentially. If we have like a bear <laughs> case here, we just like snip it out. And then like rare seasons where we come up with something valuable, we'll just like pretend that's what we're doing the whole time. Oh, okay. Okay. Not gotcha. Or, or so I've heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just thanks for telling the editor that <laughs> that was maybe a start so he could write the time down. <laughs> I mean, we're only 25 episodes in. I mean, there's there's no way we're actually, you know, going to get it by this point. <laughs> uh, so it's funny that um, we always try and hit on some news topics, but it's like we both hate calling the um, quote-unquote news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mostly because it's so devoid of actual news. Yep. It's like, where do you actually find what matters? And it's kind of like you just have to scroll the mainstream sources, or it's like whether it's Reuters or AP or New York Times, it's like you have to dig through that. Mm -hmm. like, I, I suppose the some of the key things are there. It's just they dump as much crap on top of it to do everything. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I've tried to go through and find news for you know when because Ben is usually the the guy that puts in news stories and stuff. So when I go through and try to find stuff. Oh, I never seem to find like anything that that we would want to talk about. I mean, not that the stuff that ha happens and the news stories that are out there are not important, maybe, but they just seem very superficial. And so many of them that you go, oh, well, there's something that matters. They start with premises that are just off base. And so you go, well, how can we even talk about that? And maybe that is the story. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, sometimes it is more entertaining just looking at how things get spun honestly <laughs> it more insights than uh than anything else so i think i i uh read something like that in a book once it was like i can uh i can gather more from the way an answer is framed than than just the um i guess the most basic element of the answer hmm like in what terms do you coach it or how do you uh, qualify the answer and so on? Like how do you explain it? So when you have more than a simple answer, something that's expanded, you can actually glean a lot from that as far as I guess what the author is trying to get at or right. what they're trying to promote perhaps. <clears throat> that's kind of the way I try to break it down and since most mainstream news reporters are in the club. Kind of the, the outlook they're supposed to take is, is kind of uh, been uh, programmed into them. So you get a proper broad swap of supposedly different outlets. Yeah, because I mean, I think there's still a carryover in people's mind that journalism is supposed to be neutral and is supposed to be just simply a presentation of the facts. And that's what journalism should be. But we also have to remember that people who write news stories are people and are often bringing their own biases to it. Now, obviously, you have opinion pieces and things like that, which you, you know, expect that will be biased one way or the other, depending on the person's views. But yeah, I think I think there's a lot. I th I think I mean I'm not in that world, and neither are you. But I suspect there is a lot of top-down pressure from the tops of news organizations to promote certain, uh, shall we say, like leanings, either politically or whatever the current thing is. Mm -hmm. 
And then we also have people who are coming from a very liberalized uh, education system. And if you've got <clears throat> one side, I hate using sides because I don't believe in the dichotomy of right and left. But if just just to, for simplicity to, to use that idea, if you have an education system which has been infiltrated and and captured by sort of the left side, well, you're going to produce people that naturally think that way. And the result's going to be a more left-leaning media, which is what we have by and large. Yeah. I mean, similarly, I think the left-right divide can be very artificial. And it's, mm -hmm. it's more of a corporatist agenda. <laughs> oh, you mean, so you think the news media is is more acting on corporate pressures oh yeah for than sure. political pressures that's where they make the money from hmm it's more like snippets of entertainment to pull you in in between the uh, ads which are the essential bit of the business <laughs> <laughs> right interesting it would be a, a, of like a long form podcast like Rogan or something where the conversation is the core piece of the business. Yes. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Monetize it. So it's not like there isn't advertisements, but I think you could definitely say that the news that's reported is bias. Oh, for sure. To a I certain mean, size. So the question, so I guess the question I, the question I have is, is the CBC, for example, the CBC is very obviously biased towards the left side of the political aisle and a leftist agenda, I would say. Do, is that because the people who write the news stories are that way? Or is that because there is pressure from the corporate head of the CBC down to be biased to that side of the aisle. I guess that's, uh, that's the point I was trying to say, you know, and there would be some people well, that would make the argument and say the CBC is biased towards the left because the left pays them. <laughs> the left is, you know, gave them billions of dollars or whatever it was to stay in business. Well, I would say it's less likely to be from the top down because that typically doesn't work. You can't, I guess, enforce a culture from that central point. Like from a, a CEO can't really enforce a culture or create right. a general. Well, I don't, I don't mean from like one single person. I mean from like a, the, the, the governing structure of the, of the company or, or what have you. Now, I mean, there's a little bit of this is kind of like chicken and the egg situation. It's like, which came first, you know, the, uh, I guess, uh, weakening of intellectual rigor or pressure to conform to mm -hmm. state and the state is right. global agenda. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I see that as a chicken and egg problem. But so you end up, I think it turns into a bit of a feedback loop. Back yeah. Then, both sides. So there hmm. are both aspects of that. You know, if you roll forward. Um, but so I was going to derail this a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's eight, I mean, you can't you, you can't derail something that's not on the rails at all. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're like off roading, and I'm like, I want to derail this here, and it's like, you know, like, like all over. <laughs> um, but I think we talk about things like it's worse today than it was. And journalism is one aspect. We're like, man, it's like the news just doesn't tell the truth anymore. And I always mm -hmm. wonder, like, 300 years ago, were newspapers telling the truth, or were they even more flagrantly political? How long ago? Like, say, 300 years ago, for example. Right. 200. We'll go back as far as you know. But it's like, um, even as far as, like, the time of the first American presidents, it's like, media was very much partisan. It's like, mm -hmm. newspapers were owned by uh, people who had political agendas typically <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah that's right 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I don't think that that it is a new thing. Um, uh, I do feel that there is that it is more biased than it used to be, but it's it also could be um, it, that also could just because the news is everywhere now because of the internet and because we have it, we don't mm -hmm. just get our news through you know, uh, the five o'clock news and a newspaper. Mm -hmm. We literally have it on a device in our pocket mm -hmm. all the time on social media and everywhere. It's just everywhere. And so maybe it's because we get it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's why it seems more opinionated towards a certain way. Okay. So I guess that's coming from the perspective that just by sheer volume, we're just bound to be more flooded with low quality stuff. Whereas when there were limited streams where people uh, got their news or, or paid attention to reporting, I guess when it's like three channels and mm. newspapers, you know. That well, there was just, there was more limitation on, on what you reported because you, you only had so much time to report the news. And so you really, you just reported facts because it's all you had time for maybe, or it was more, you know, the, the what you did report was the really important stuff. Mm -hmm. But now because we get it from all the time, there's so much more avenue for it to be out there to create mm -hmm. quote unquote news or present news. You drift more towards opinion style pieces, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I, I really don't have a solid answer on that. That's just it's my speculation. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I've not been around for the last 200 years, but it's been, <laughs> my, been my hypothesis that things have always been very political. And I'm not, I'm not convinced that there was ever a golden era mm. in history where people were honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was probably it's it's probably waxed and waned a little bit. There's been times when it was more or less facts based, and yeah. Hmm. hmm. It's hard to gauge though, because I mean, there are also periods in history where there's less contradictory things, and so mm -hmm. maybe less obvious that things were. That's cheap. true, because we definitely live in a very polarized society. Mm hmm. And, you know, we can think so back even to find opposing opinions and not just opposing as in a dichotomy, but opinions that come from all different. Yeah, forms, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, you, part of it, you have to, I guess, consider, I guess, how, how strongly the culture at large demands integrity and actually wants journalism. Mm -hmm. Most people don't, and it shouldn't surprise us that it doesn't get produced. Mm -hmm. So, you know, laws of supply and demand come into effect there. That's right. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to talk to a journalist or someone who had a good grasp on the history of journalism mm -hmm. <clears throat> who's been in the business to, uh, give kind of an inside view of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I have heard it expressed before that even if you have people who are very connected in the center of, you know, significant events, whether this is government leaders or military leaders, that even if someone who's been there uh, wants to like write a book about it and report on it as truthfully as possible, it's, it's almost impossible for them to hit on the facts of the matter because I mean, the mere fact of being uh, an integral part of it means you have seen more, but it also means what you've seen is more of the, uh, the cycle of, um, I guess, what people want to be or the story kind of that's promoted. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, in the military, it's like you often shape things a certain way it's like your enemy is definitely the bad guy and you got to promote a lot of patriotism and so on and so sure. uh, unbiased looks at things aren't exactly what you'll find at uh you know a, a meeting of that sort. 
<laughs> yeah. It, it, a phenomenon, it, phenomenon of, of yes men, I guess is what it's right. called. And it's like when those circles of power, more often than not, they have, uh, I guess, opinions are expected to hold or. Um, yeah, I, I think you, yeah, you definitely have to find the right person who sees the world for what it truly is and sees the organization for what it truly is while still working inside of it. But yeah, and that's, that? that's requiring you to be an outsider while inside a club. Well, I think you can do that to a certain extent. Maybe. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I have like to use the military example because I have quite a number of military friends, either current or former military friends. Mm -hmm. And higher than the rank of private, like guys who were officers and sort of saw things from the inside. Mm -hmm. And sure, they support the military. They did tours overseas. They believed in the mission. But at the same time, they also saw how the soup was made. You know, mm -hmm. they fully acknowledge the, the problems with the military with the direction it's headed, the leadership that is there, um, you know, just everything about it. <clears throat> they, they recognize those are problems and they're serious problems, but at the same time they did their job as to the best of their ability. And so mm. I like, do they have a slightly skewed? Well, yeah, because that was their life. That was their career. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they were able to look at it. Uh, if not from a third person view, like detached from it, but they were at least able to look objectively at it. And that's really all you can ask is someone to be honestly objective about something. And we all have biases. So really can anybody be said to give an honest view of something that they're heavily involved in well no we all have biases so really you're just asking people to be as objective as possible um when analyzing something mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, something i was interested in looking at i guess is what the general view on the economic situation is. Mm. Um, so I was pulling up a few of the most recent articles about the state of the economy and uh, kind of had to laugh at one headline I saw. <laughs> Plainer, how will we know if the US is in recession? <laughs> yeah. I thought we were already there, but apparently I was, I was wrong. So I, I need to understand. <laughs> whether or not we're there yet. No. These sorts of news stories to me really scream of the disconnect between the politicians and the common people. I say the common people as if they're like peasants, but you know what I mean? The everyday man. Because the everyday man says, I'm struggling to pay my bills. My work is not necessarily secure. You know, the cost of everything's going up. Mm -hmm. they, they, they look at all these things and they say, we're in economic hard times. Mm -hmm. But the politicians just continue, and by extension, the media, <laughs> as like this news story, you know, shows, um, Really are tr really are trying to paint their own picture and say, yeah, yeah, you know, I oh, we're not we're not in a recession, you know, this everything's hunky dory. I think part of it is wishful thinking. I mean, <clears throat> kind of all that underlying desperation for things to be going in an optimistic direction. <laughs> so, so it's like paint as rosy a picture. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, there, there, there's a failing economic system. I mean, the, the Keynesian experiment is really winding down here and the politicians are, they've been riding that wave for a century and they're really now trying to just 
hold things together. That's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the whole mess of quantitative tightening, quantitative easing, and trying to somehow manage <laughs> try, the Fed trying to manage interest rates and inflation mm -hmm. in a reactionary way because the market's going to do what the market's going to do and they can influence it, but they don't control it. And so just that whole thing, you could, it's very obvious. They're just desperately trying to keep this, kick this can as far down the road because, and this is something I actually had a thought of this week, it kind of ties into the economic stuff because I think it's the biggest danger for our countries right at the moment is the economic situation. What incentive is there for a politician to make any sort of real change? Now, I mean, I, I think, I think governments, I think governments should be completely out of the business of doing business. My own personal belief is that they shouldn't have anything to do with the markets. The market should be a truly free market. Mm -hmm. no, but guess, that's not where we are. <laughs> when, when you, uh, I guess if you want to pry into uh, what incentive do they have for change, I think we see that they're highly motivated to affect some sorts of change, uh, generally in the growth of that particular individual's net worth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> but, but all of those changes are not fundamental changes. They're all very surface changes. Right? Oh, well, we're going to, you know, send you a check for 500 bucks to help oh, you with well, the rising costs of rent. The politician's net worth increasing. <laughs> no, yes. No, I, I realize that. That that for yeah. sure. They always look out for their own interest. Yeah. But to make to actually make trying some sort of change, what is there's no incentive for politicians to make real change. change culture. Yeah. Well, that would yeah. I mean, that would require for them to have I guess a bit of a vision. Mm -hmm. And I think frequent election cycles mean that even if you have a vision, you're not going to have the time to put it into effect. Mm -hmm. So all you're doing is, uh, I guess, it's like a constant war of attrition. Mm -hmm. You hold the position of power and, you know, like gain another half mile in the trenches. So yep. it's not, it's not a... Not something where you uh, uh, produce fine works of art. <laughs> and so this work. really comes down to time preference, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Like because politicians, because they only have a four-year cycle of power, mm -hmm. potentially, yeah. they have a very short time preference. Mm -hmm. They... They want... They have, they have such a short amount of time to do anything that they can never, they have no incentive to actually recreate something better, like change the economic system <laughs> mm. or reduce spending and a sort of a slow switch to become more fiscally responsible mm -hmm. because that, that can't happen in four years. We're, we're at the point now where you simply cannot say, well, we're going to turn off the taps of socialism Mm -hmm. right like you just you can't do that in today's society it needs to happen it's going to happen that is going to be the end result and it will hurt a lot of people so if you want to do it without hurting people then you need to do it slowly but you can't do that in four years it has to be done with a vision over time mm -hmm. <clears throat> i think that's one of the the biggest failings of of a democratic system hmm. there's yeah, there's to actually affect change as a democratically elected leader now what what circumstances would it take i think the first thing is probably being highly motivated to benefit your community so if it's a place you actually live in and so basically you can't get bigger than the level of a small town before you lose that element right Mm -hmm. Someone who's actually living in the community has to interact with people, and there's some culpability there. Mm -hmm. you know, like the people know where you are, and they can uh, uh, <laughs> run next to your house. 
if you're making everybody's life miserable. <laughs> so that's you know, a longer time preference, which is helped if you're not simply worried about winning the next election, if you're not a careerist. So if you're actually, if you're well set up, um, you're living in the community, so you want to, you're motivated to make it better. You're not strongly motivated to make your own life better because you already get it sorted through your own endeavors. Mm -hmm. And then what you're trying to do is actually serve the community and give back. That kind of seems like the circumstances where you're more likely to get someone who's going to focus on doing good things instead of focusing on getting reelected. I think it's a real strong case for a monarchy system of government. Okay, you know, so I was kind of picturing things at a town level, but now we're going to yeah. jump to the national level. And you think a monarchy has some of those same elements? elements in it well even at a town level uh, it, even at a town level you have you know let's say a town council right mm -hmm. most towns are root they may have a mayor but they also have a council that's democratically elected but that election cycle is still happening every four years mm -hmm. or what or however long you know long it's set for so they still have a short cycle of even being on a council that could have that would affect change and the mayor too, he's elected every every four years. Okay, so we have to expand this a little further then. So is it, I think it's possible even with say a four year election cycle for you not to have to shift to a short time preference. If you know that your successors are going to continue good work. Like if right. as long as you don't feel that everything's gonna get screwed up and then mm -hmm. it's like all of a sudden you have to deep prioritize the long-term mission and you have to maintain power so that right. you can accomplish your mission and then just getting reelected sucks all your energy away from what you had envisioned doing well because you have to affect fast promises short-term promises to get elected because people have very short memories okay. and they want their cookie and they want <laughs> it you know 100 days after you're elected <laughs> kind of thing and mm. so I mean, you see what presidents say. Presidents, when they do their election campaign, it's always, these are the things I will do with the first 100 days after I'm elected, right? And then they're rated basically by, by the country, like how much of that did you accomplish in that 100 days? People want their cookies right away. So I don't know. Hard to get past for sure. Like, the, well, that's that's the thing, and that's why I that's why I bring the monarchy thing up for it, because it's not pop. Like, that's an intriguing one for sure. Well, we because have like, this. I, what, what's the first objection? Like, if you bring that up to someone. Yeah. Well, I was I just going to say, like, we have this idea that a democracy, whether it's a representative democracy or whatever, mm -hmm. is like the pinnacle of human invention for freedom. You know, it's, it's the best there is. And I think we've been brainwashed by modern society to say that a democracy is the best form of government. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think that at all. It's probably well, one of the better ones. <laughs> like democracy is a terrible form of government problem is that all the others are works yeah <laughs> well certainly we can start at the uh at the place of all government forms of government are bad <laughs> but but no governance is also bad yes of course there are many many levels because in individually <clears throat> the individual governs themselves that's right and that is the most essential form of governance that's right so the whole uh, the whole notion of it's like we need no government. It's like, well, I don't think you're. That's not a very in depth statement of the problem. <laughs> no, no, no. The problem is distribution of power. It's like you can't make a situation where there is not power that is being wielded. It's merely distribution. Yes. And like the state of I'm gonna I'm gonna say the state of a culture. The so culture seems to be the word that best describes, I guess, the general state of a population as far as their uh, 
I guess, morality and, and preferences and actions in general. Yeah, I think what the statement I was trying to make about no government being there is no governors on the scale we have now and the, mm. the, the governance goes closer to a self-governance mm -hmm. with, with much more localized authority over a population. Mm -hmm. And that limits what it's able to do and limits the man it can mess up. <laughs> But to, but to get back to the time preference thing and the monarchy thing, I mean, you probably see it anyway, how a monarchy encourages how, like a longer time preference. Hmm. I would think so. In most cases, you can make the logical case <clears throat> that the fact that you are passing this down like there's a line of succession. That's right. That's good. It's going to your children and their children. It should result in you caring a little more about the state of things. That's right. Now, of course, that's not always the case. And I think anybody who wanted to critique uh, hypothesizing about whether or not this works better or not is going to point to that and they'll pick out the worst tyrant, probably. Mm -hmm. That's right. Like yeah, certainly a, there's, there's no... Very, very much wrong <laughs> say that again that things can go very wrong like it could be disastrous yeah under a really tyrannical minded dictator yes no i agree i i think that in principle the parliamentary monarchs monarchy does work because it puts a check and balance on the monarch I think just the problem is that, at least in the case of you know the United Kingdom, the monarchy s continued to go towards merely a figurehead mm -hmm. type of system, and the parliamentary side of it basically took over all governance. Yes. yes. <clears throat> so I think if you could find, I think when that was more of a balancing act, I think it worked a lot better as far as allowing for some sort of representation of the people for their own governance, but also having the long-term view of the monarch, um, not allowing mob rule, but also, yeah, having that long-term view of what's best for the country in the long term. Mm. Yeah, it would be interesting, I mean, especially now that it's, it's kind of... Um, the time in which we kind of look back at the reign of Queen Elizabeth too, and it's it would be interesting to have like that alternate timeline where she was mm. in actual power. Yes, just something she never had. No, not really. Immense wealth and and you know privilege and position, and you know she fulfilled uh, the expectations that were placed on the monarch for the time period she lived in, but. There's no um, ability to like take hold and, and start issuing directives. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. But I think it's it's more likely than not that it would have been uh, better circumstances than uh, what, what happened with UK under however many prime ministers came and went during her reign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and she could have she she could have had she could have had a couple more if uh she <laughs> lived till, yeah. till the last couple of weeks. Uh she missed out on two. Yeah. See the way that the way that works in the British system is they um the the house elects like they elect the prime minister, I think from from the house of representatives like they i'm not sure the exact terminology but it's not like that it's a member it's not a party system quite in the same way that we have or when you're prime minister you're prime minister for four years period no, they can, no, no. I mean, we have that parliamentary system here in canada as well yes but, but over there that they've had two leaders lose popularity and we still can't <laughs> 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 like we have the worst luck yeah yeah 
Yeah, it was. Uh, I don't know how much you followed that, I, and I don't really know exactly why. Uh, what was her name? Liz Truss. Liz, yeah, why she resigned or was forced to resign essentially lack is what happened. Support, basically, well, it was lack of support, but I, I'm trying to think what it was in her policies that was so hated, and I think it was a. A turn. Was it a turning to bailing out, like printing money again? I'm not sure, and I'm also not sure that that issue is understood enough in politics to be mm. a swing issue, as far as confidence or no confidence. Yeah, I'm not sure. The political cliques kind of at war. And right. someone who wasn't very popular, but kind of won because there's no, uh, no stronger, more or more dominant figure, no more popular figure. Right. So it's interesting. And it, um, like when you have a leader lose confidence, but you have no one who's an obvious successor. Mm. It's like in a parliamentary system, things get uh, really complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those power like, vacuums can be can be filled by. Eventually, really... it's like someone gets pushed forward, and people are like, "Well, there's nobody else, sort of, right at the moment." But then it's like, then a month later, it's like, "Man, it's like we don't like this person. We never did. It's like we had to go along with it for two weeks." Yeah. It's like then, over the course of those few weeks, you start getting, uh, I guess, some planning and some centralizing around. The, the ambitious people who are, I guess, collecting supporters mm -hmm. and have that, that flip to with another leader. The funniest thing I heard is that, is it Boris Yeltsin? Who is the previous, is that was his uh, name? Johnson. Johnson, Boris Johnson. Johnson. No idea who, it was Boris anyway, Johnson. Who, yeah, that's it. Who was forced to step down as prime minister like a couple few months back. He's now in the running to potentially be elected again <laughs> as, as prime minister. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, interesting stuff happening over there. They are really like- grass is not greener on the other side of the fence. You get over there and- That's right. Here. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's for sure. Uh, amusingly enough was a uh, president of Russia. For yeah, he had, that's, I knew I knew that name somewhere. Yeah, he was president of Russia back uh, when I was a kid, I think. Anyway, <clears throat> it's interesting that the, the, I mean, the British economy is r struggling so hard right now. Like you think of what are the biggest, you know, the most stable currencies in the world. And the first, the first is us. And the second that comes to mind to me is the United Kingdom, the British pound, mm -hmm. but they are really in dire straits they've lost their their the british pound has lost a lot of ground to the us dollar mm -hmm. in the last couple of weeks i mean a big part of that must be the economic upset from exiting the european union uh you know, those are kind of the worst circumstances for, uh, I guess, expanding business and exports and trade as as well as they could be when you have uncertainties about rules and regulations and trade agreements. It's like uncertainty yeah. decentivizes business so much. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's probably part of it. But I think a lot of it is just this inflationary model and the fact that the U.S. is like you hear like Pelosi talk about, you know, Oh, it, talking about inflation in the United States. And she said, yes, but it's much worse everywhere else. All every other country is struggling so much with their currencies and how much they've inflated them. It's much better here. It's bad, but it's much better here but doesn't acknowledge that the fact that us is inflating it and all other currencies are based on the us dollar means that all the other 
countries in the world experiencing inflation are experiencing it because of the U.S. dollar and their inflation. Really? I mean, I guess if you never printed a, a dollar of money, it probably wouldn't be hitting you as bad. Like, everyone's culpable here. But the further away from the money, pr the money printer you are, right? Mm-hmm the harder the effect is. Yeah, I was listening to a podcast um, and one interesting thing they brought up was that Europe is got kind of this economic union, but they never really centralized the government very strongly. Mm -hmm. Like there's not an easy way to have fiscal restraint yeah. Because the countries are largely still independent as far as how they want to spend their money. And yet you mm -hmm. have a single currency. And so it's a system that is fairly dysfunctional, or at least high risk, in that yeah. you don't even have the ability to, to control things. <laughs> That's right. As far as the whole money central planning thing. It's like they added the first bit, which is actually having... The single currency but then there's not that i guess better all reserve that's supposed to chart the path and keep things on the on the rails <laughs> yeah so definitely hmm. something I'm eager to learn more about some of the best podcasts have been uh ones interviewing lynn alden um seems like those have been pretty good at laying out uh, different economics and in, in internationally as well. So yeah, um, what Bitcoin did has uh, her own uh, quarterly usually, I think. So okay, that's been fairly helpful. So I've never listened to that show. That's one of my favorite. <laughs> Definitely recommend. <laughs> Anyway, back in the real world, <laughs> sometimes it seems like, yeah, you get into the whole politics thing and it is kind of like exiting mm. the real world. It's like a, yeah. it's like a bad TV show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, back in the real world, I'm killing pigs this weekend, so... <laughs> uh, Saturday. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna slaughter them tomorrow, later in the day, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, butcher them on, cut them all up in, uh, on Saturday. So. Yeah. So yeah, it's always good times. <laughs> I rigged up a couple, a little bit different way to do, do the skinning. Cause always before we just used the bucket of the tractor and lifted them up mm -hmm. and it, I mean, it works, but it, 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 it never works well. <laughs> it just always seems like the, it just hangs in your way. You think it would just like come right. Anyway, it just, it always seemed to be a chore. It would take me as long to skin two pigs as it would to cut up two pigs. Mm -hmm. so <clears throat> what i built last night i went out to the shop and i built myself a skinning table it's basically it's like a i don't know a foot wide or a little better kind of with a shallow v shape mm -hmm. to it about okay three or four feet long yeah and so you can lay your animal on its back uh -huh. sort of in this cradle and then at that gives you access to the inside of the legs mm -hmm. and down the belly and things like that much easier. Um, okay. So then, you start with the incision down the underside of the animal and peel it off working towards the spine on both sides. Yeah, basically, basically you do down the middle and then on the hind legs you do from yeah, sort of center, uh, center up, up to the, you know, the, the hawks. Mm -hmm. And then once you get that started, sort of on the sides, uh, up to the front legs, and on the rear quarter, you get it started. But 
the way that I'm going to do it different this year is I'm going to leave the feet, the rear feet attached to the skin so that once that is peeled down the side, I'm going to hook onto that and attach it to something really solid down next to the ground and yeah. then use the bucket of the tractor to lift and try to just peel the skin right off in a more mechanical way rather than having to actually cut the okay, entire okay. what are you lifting on the uh the hide you're li you're you're Parking lifting on the carcass you're lifting the carcass and the and the the, and the hide, is, pinned down. hide is is attached down yeah huh. i'm just going to attach to like the hitch of the yeah. truck or something like that yeah. okay I'm, I'm hoping that's going to speed up the process and make it a little bit easier mm -hmm. easier to do but. all right huh that's cool so yeah hmm. anything happening with gardening have you had to uh drain hydroponic systems yet or i haven't yet but i think saturday night was supposed to be quite cold here down below freezing um if i have a chance saturday i'm gonna have to blow my system out uh maybe not in the greenhouse but i've got a couple lines like a line going out to the field yeah uh out to the orchards so that i'll probably have to blow out at least i'll probably be okay in the greenhouse even if it gets down to one or two degrees below freezing mm -hmm. i'll probably be okay the only th place i'd be worried is my pump that's outside so yeah I'll wait till Saturday and see what the forecast is saying. And I may at that time have to pull the whole system. Thing is, we still have like, we've got lettuce growing in the aquaponics right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of want to keep that going as long as possible in the greenhouse, but. Yeah. Is the uh, growth slower since we have short. Oh yeah 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 lettuce is really dependent on light mm -hmm. for its growth yeah. the temperatures yeah. right now are the temperatures right now are the same as what they'd be in the spring but the growth is much slower just because there's less light yeah yeah because right now let's see at the end of october so you're probably at are we at uh 10 and a half hours of yeah 10 and a half 11 right around that <clears throat> big difference from uh 14 and a half <laughs> <laughs> it is it's a huge difference so yeah i've got some of that in the aquaponic system uh head lettuce and then we've got uh still in the greenhouse a cold frame set up and we've got lettuce growing in that lettuce and spinach right in mm -hmm. the ground so that will probably keep going as long as we possibly can mm -hmm. So we should get another month out of that because we can close that cold frame and it'll still get quite warm in there um, through the day and that'll hold enough heat in overnight so that it won't freeze. Okay. So there's, a, I have a book on, it's called Four Season Gardening. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. This guy gardens year round. And so the first thing, of course you say is, oh, where is he, you know, down in the Carolinas or something? He's in Maine. Wow. Or New Hampshire. I can't remember which. He might be in southern Maine, I think. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a little bit warmer than us, but they still get very cold temperatures. But yeah, he gardens year round. Okay, with, so uh, you have that controlled environment. So is it greenhouse or is it artificial? Cold lighting? frames. Cold frame cold frames outside. So lower than a greenhouse structure. Yeah. Is that main difference i'd say i haven't like i've looked through the book i haven't actually read it cover to cover like flat basically a square structure Bas basically basically they're flat with okay. i think they're probably insulated on the sides but if mm -hmm. not they're they're definitely made of like thicker wood yeah and then the, the top is glass and okay. you you have to start all your seeds basically the way it works is you plant everything in the fall when it's still warm enough and you have enough light for stuff to really get started. Uh -huh. And then you just basically, you keep it alive and grow all winter with it. Hmm. So what sort of things was he growing though? It's like, you must be limited. A, lo a lot of greens, but I'm pretty sure he was growing like root crops and stuff as well. Yeah. Not growing tomatoes or, 
you know, anything like that. All very cold hardy yeah. type plants. Okay. So yeah. like maybe you could a like kale and Brussels sprouts and yeah, like, you know, lettuces and anything that, that, that tolerates cold relatively well. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you keep the frost off of lettuce, it'll tolerate below freezing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So never tried that. Yeah. And, and then of course there's a lot of things like it's gotta be very tight. So you don't have any drafts. It's gotta be, you know, you don't go out first thing in the morning when it's minus 20 and open up your top, mm -hmm. you know, to, to pick some salad. You wait until the afternoon when it's, you know, much yeah. warmer and the sun's out and, and then, mm -hmm. you know, so there's stuff like that. Obviously you have to be, you know, to, to practice in order to yeah. keep so stuff alive. But is there any sort of like thermal battery built into that? Like I could see, you know, having like, uh, cinder blocks being like the mm -hmm. north wall and painting it black so you have sunlight right. hitting that. Uh, like cinder blocks would, would work both ways because it's also a a pretty good energy transfer. So I suspect just using a, a heavy wood would be your best bet. Probably the, the ground itself is probably, and I'm not sure, I can't remember how big these are. But no, I don't remember him, there being any discussion of, of any sort of thermal <laughs> Just the wood. I mean, wood is dark itself, so you should get some absorption if you mm -hmm. have I think the big thing was making sure it's tight and so that you, yeah. your solar gain is completely captured and not lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the smaller space is pretty critical. You couldn't do it like my greenhouse. You could never do that because it's just, it's just too big. There's too much volume there that to try and keep heated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you use the same um, same varieties of lettuce hydroponically that you do outside in the soil? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We use we do uh, better than others because I've thought about uh, getting my tiny little crack key hydroponic system going again. Mm -hmm. uh, first shot I had with it uh, last winter. Kind of surprised me that the lettuce didn't seem as strong as I expected. Definitely not as any that I'd seen growing in soil. It's like yeah. maybe my uh, fertilizer mix wasn't quite right, although. I really it. struggled with it last year, too, because I tried a little hot hydroponics last year, and I couldn't get anything to grow in it. So most of the stuff was growing, but it seemed it was definitely more flimsy. Mm -hmm. Like it was not getting, you know, thick and sturdy leaves. Yeah, like you pick something, you definitely notice it was a lot more of a flimsy leaf, even though it yes. seemed like the size was getting there. Is that yeah. something you see? That that was my experience as well. Yeah, I hmm. with the aquaponics, I didn't notice really any difference, just with the hydroponics. Oh. So, so it must the, be a fertility issue then. I would guess. I would guess because my system wasn't really any different between the two, other than one was chemical fertilizer and one was <laughs> natural fertilizer. Um, that was really the only difference. Now I did notice that my I did have issues with successive batches in the aquaponic system, not the outdoor one, just the the indoor one. My very small indoor one I built originally. The first one usually was good, but then the successive ones over the winter struggled more and more. So I don't know if that was, I'm not sure the reason for that. I never did figure it out. So if there was some sort of mineral that was lacking that my outdoor system gets somehow, <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think it would be any different though. The volume of water certainly would be different. So the volume of water in my greenhouse different uh, system, I have to add a lot more water to upkeep it, mm -hmm. you know, to keep it topped up. But inside, you hardly added any. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's something naturally in my water that's a mineral that the plants need that was getting supplemented. So, yeah, it's hard to track down. Could it even hypothetically be biological? Something that was present in one system, but absent in the other. Uh, maybe. I do use pond water for my greenhouse system. 
but you would think that uh i don't know you would think that anything that you needed would would be present they're both from fish mm. culture but mm. don't know i never really quite yeah got that one figured out but i don't run my small system anymore so it doesn't matter <laughs> but uh I'd like to try to set up a do fodder again, but I don't, I don't have a great place to do it. Um, okay. So like sprouting grain, sprouting grain for, for animals and stuff. I just, I did it years ago and it, and it worked good. It worked okay. But I just don't, I don't have a good place space. If I had like a basement or a heated garage or someplace that I didn't mind making a mess, it would be a lot easier, but I don't, I don't have a good place in my house to, yeah to do it. Because, yeah, you end up with a lot of, well, humidity and mm -hmm. and organic matter and stuff. It, it's not the sort of thing you fling around the house. <laughs> no, no, that's right. Well, it, the only place I have is in my back room and I've got like shelves, but mm -hmm. it's also the shelves we use for storage. So yeah, you'd come out and it'd be like somebody pushed the toilet paper too close, you know, the package of toilet paper too close to the system and then it got wet and, you know, it just, yeah, it, it, it did didn't do well. Yeah. I mean, it did, it did good for a while I had it, but it just was seemed to be, take a lot of maintenance mm -hmm. to keep it yep. to upkeep but it. So a lot easier with a dedicated space, if I had a dedicated space, I didn't mind making the mess or something. It would be easier, but anyway, I still would like to do that because I feel like I, I know the animals loved it and they were very healthy. Um, giving them basically fresh greens all winter mm -hmm. rather than just grain. So it was, and it was cheap because you could, because of the nutrient change that happens in that sprouting process, uh -huh. you didn't need as much grain. You didn't feed as much grain. Your, your, how do I say this? Your fodder, Used, you used less grain with fodder, sprouting for fodder, than you would if you fed the grain direct. Mm -hmm. That basically is what I'm trying to say. Sounds like magic. <laughs> Sounds like magic, but it basically has to do with the protein and what happens when, when the grain is sprouted. Mm -hmm. So. Bioavailability, things like Bioavailability, that. Bioavailability, I mean, yeah. But even like the amount of protein changed. I'm pretty sure that's anyway. It's been a few years, so I forget all the the science part of it. <laughs> hmm. Did you find you could keep uh, birds laying better over the winter, or was that not a priority? Uh, I if that would be enough because most most birds tend to kind of slack off. And I've heard a couple different theories. One is that you're better off your birds are better off with a bit of a, a layoff time hmm. and, well they have a natural molting time yeah. but they and they're very light sensitive as well so um we do try to we do have a light out in the barn for them so they they still get their 14 15 hours of light even if it's not you know natural sunlight or whatever mm -hmm. and that does help uh keep them laying so I, I didn't find that made any difference one way or the other. We usually don't have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. um, but they just enjoyed it more. They were just healthier because they were getting a more natural food, you know. Yeah. So. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Hmm. I haven't had anything else going on in my backyard as much as I'd like to be adding things. <laughs> <laughs> one uh, garden bed is a pretty decent uh, area. I haven't yeah. got the shovel down on that, and I kind of think that's essential to get mm -hmm. down on that before the winter. So that's on my list, but I've ended up doing some indoor projects in the garage. Yeah, the here. wife got all her garlic planted oh. last week, I think. Um, I don't think she said she planted, uh, I heard it was a lot. 
950? 950? That is a lot. <laughs> so that's like at least double from last year. So. Hmm. And what's the like primary use for it? Is it in canning? Uh, she do some that way. We use it a lot in cooking, um, but she sells a lot of it. She sells, she makes like a, a garlic braid yeah. basically. And then because she grows flowers as well. So she'll have certain dry, dried flowers that she grows and she weaves those in mm -hmm. um, to the, to the braid mm -hmm. and then, okay. and then sells it. And so it's sort of a, a value added type thing. You know, she can sell yeah. one of those for like I'll almost 40, the... almost $40 for, for a braid. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. Giving a boost to the value of the, just the plain garlic. Yep. Cool. And then she's got, I don't know, at least, at least one person that just, you know, buys some garlic from her every year just to have like, um, but yeah, I would say most of what she doesn't keep for herself goes to, goes to the garlic braids. Have you done any apple cider this year or no? We didn't do any this year. Uh, I don't even, I don't know if we're going to, I'd like to, but I just don't, I don't know that we have the time mm -hmm. apple season really is winding down fast and really over in a lot of, you know, in a lot of ways we put in quite a few apples this year, but we didn't, we didn't make any cider. So, um, cause usually we pick, uh, apples off that old orchard up by your place. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there was any on that this year. It was sort of an off year for there that was, orchard. There were some. Um, I went out and uh, I was picking some with my wife, and the the bird damage was fairly high. So it was oh, like really? It was hard to find apples that didn't have broken skin. Okay. Um, so that was a little bit tough as far as taking any to store. So he ended up mm. uh, making a bunch of applesauce. Um, is there was just yeah, no no shelf life? Yeah. Damage. So there was some, but I mean, there are trees we don't uh, provide any extra inputs. It's like cattle. That's down. right. <laughs> yep. That's it. So it's kind of like free apples. It's like we didn't plant them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're sitting under the, you're, you're eating the apple that somebody else uh, planted. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, ho hopefully there'll be a, a like apples are quite cyclical. So next year, hopefully there'll be lots of apples there, and we'll be able to make. I mean, we still have cider left over from last year because okay. I think we did like fifty gallons last year, fifty sixty gallons. Mm -hmm. But um, the one thing I will miss is usually I I take uh, a pail of it and make make like hard cider with mm -hmm. a pail. Um, and it turned out quite nice last year. And I, that lasted me most of the year actually. Um, but I won't have that this year. So. All right. Well, it's nice that we're finally getting over the, some of the fall stuff, or at least we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> and that light is a snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah. <laughs> that's the light of my tractor in the dark trying to blow two foot snow drifts <laughs> unfortunate to not have snow yet but we need to have some time when we get it get to winter so yeah i get some of my next year planning underway and all that sort of thing so yeah i mean as as kind of i mean i wouldn't say depressing but as winter goes for, you know, the being kind of sucky driving and cold and the pressures of trying to keep the house warm and all that sort of stuff. It, it is nice to have that downtime where it, you're kind of go, okay, I can just hang out these evenings. Cause I don't have a million jobs to do and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Oh, it'll be good to have our, our, uh, other, our third, third wheel. <laughs> I'm going to try and make a joke about him being a, a Disney star since uh, 
ESPN <laughs> owns like 30% of TSN. And I know his uh, that uh, Lumberjack Championship ends up on TSN. So, okay. I don't know his leg about that a little bit, but I don't know if it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. He's missed two week, two weeks in a row, so I don't know. We're, we, we have to have a discussion about whether we're going to let him back on or not. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it sound like it's a survivor. <laughs> That's right. Sorry, man, you've been traded. <laughs> we, we're, we're, we're dumping your contract for cap space. <laughs> uh, All right. Listen. So we'll be back at it with gardening and money and all other crazy things next week. All right. Have a good night.